we've heard the account from Acts of what we call Pentecost, a time when the Holy Spirit is poured out in power upon the followers of Jesus enabling them to complete the mission that he's given them, to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, to tell people about him and his kingdom of justice and joy and peace, to teach them how to follow Jesus themselves by telling them what Jesus taught. But we have something to learn as well by remembering uh, about this festival that we call Pentecost, uh, which is what the festival at the time was called because it celebrated 50 days after Passover. And Passover was a feast being celebrated at the time Jesus was crucified. At Passover, Jewish people remember how God saved them by miraculously rescuing them out of Egypt, out of slavery under Pharaoh. At Passover, Jewish people celebrate their freedom and their birth as a nation of Israel. But when Christ dies and rises again, God makes it possible for everybody to be saved. He miraculously rescues us from sin and death. At Easter, Christians celebrate this freedom from slavery, from sin of death, freedom for all people and all nations through Jesus Christ. Well, the Jewish name of the festival celebrated at Pentecost is Shavuot. It is a festival which celebrates God giving the law to his people at Mount Sinai. It celebrates the old covenant God makes with the people of Israel. But at Pentecost, Christians celebrate God giving the Holy Spirit to all people. This is the new covenant for everybody where God puts his law in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. And Pentecost was also a festival of first fruits. The first fruits of the harvest were brought and offered to God. The first fruits were the sign of what was to come, the hope. And when we hear this account from Acts, we can see that those first 3,000 converts, the first 3,000 were the first fruits of a worldwide harvest of Jesus followers. What happened? at Pentecost in Acts 2 is a sign of what was to come, of a harvest that includes us, praise God, and of the harvest of more followers of Jesus that we are called to sow and water and gather as well. Because you know, Jesus did amazing things when he was on earth, but he also said that his followers would do even greater things. Now I struggle to get my head around that, but Jesus says, we might do even greater things than he did. It's hard to believe, isn't it? But that's Jesus's words. When Jesus was here on earth, he was God and he was human and he was in one place working with the one in front of him. So Jesus, in his three years of ministry here, had how many disciples? 12 or 72 or more. And Jesus trained up those disciples to do the things he did to heal the sick and cast out demons, and teach the things he taught, the good news of the kingdom of God. And then Jesus, after he was resurrected and taught them some more, was ascended. He rose back into heaven, to his heavenly throne, where he reigns over all things. But as we remember and celebrate today, Pentecost, Jesus sent his Holy Spirit, which means that through his Holy Spirit, Jesus is present all over the world through his followers. He is loving, healing, casting out demons, bringing transformation in people's lives and communities all over the world. How is this possible? Because Jesus is reigning over all. He is the head. He is the head of the church. And Jesus is not head of the church like somebody is head or boss of a company. In a company there's hierarchy, the big boss and then smaller bosses and all the way down to the tea boy or whoever. The workers at the bottom will never know the big boss for themselves. He will never give them instructions or training directly. But it's not like that for us, the church. 
When we talk about Jesus as the head of the church, we need to think more of the head on our body. Our head, our brain, sends messages to every single part of our body. It tells our heart to beat, our lungs to breathe, our fingers to move, our eyes and our ears, our speech are all connected to our brain. Everything in our body acts by following the impulses coming from our brain. Our head is the source of all we do. We're familiar with this image of the church as a body. We've heard so many times how we all have our different parts to play and we're all important. But you know, recently it has really struck me how important it is to realise that each and every part of the body is directly connected to and controlled by the head. It reminds us that each one of us, me and you, is connected directly to Jesus by his spirit. And we can receive his instructions directly from him. We are directly in relationship with him. He's given us his word, the Bible, and his Holy Spirit to help us understand, help us discern what is true and right and good, what is like Jesus. And this is the basis on which Baptist Church are governed under Christ by the church meeting. We believe that each and every believer, because they have the Holy Spirit, is able to discern God's will. And even more so as we gather together, we can seek and discern God's will. As I shared in this week's newsletter, I have recently decided to stop using Bible notes because I was finding it far too easy to skim over the Bible passage and then concentrate on somebody else's thoughts, rather than asking God to speak through his word to me. Because we so easily have this idea that someone else is better qualified to hear from God and that we can't do it for ourselves. You know, our whole system of church over the centuries has given us the impression that we need some expert, some professional to interpret for us, to minister to us. And I think we need to regain our confidence in ourselves that God has chosen to put his spirit in each one of us, in every one of us, in all of us, because he loves each of us and he wants each of us to know him. God has chosen to fill me and you with his Holy Spirit and he gives me and you, each one of us, gifts because he wants to work through each of us, me and you. As Baptists, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. That is, we are all called to minister to one another, to love, encourage, support, challenge, teach, and pray for one another. You know, the idea of a paid minister originally was so that somebody could be freed up from having to spend all their time earning a living so that they could devote more time to studying the scripture, to preparing to teach or to care pastory for people. But you know, this has led in a way to some really unhelpful things. Firstly, by providing somebody to feed the sheep as it were, we can get into the habit of thinking that we can only hear God's word from the preacher. You know, in the Bible, it tells us about how we might still need milk when we should be eating meat. Well, sometimes, if we're honest, we don't always want to put in that work to feed ourselves. And we don't even want the, the preacher or the teacher to mash up the meat for us. So it's a bit easier to chew. You know, sometimes we want the preacher or the teacher to be like a spiritual mum, to eat the meat for us, digest it and turn it into milk. Now, there might be lots of arguments for breastfeeding and breastfeeding children for longer. But, you know, spiritually, that is not the way to go. If we want to grow spiritually, we need to get weaned. We have to learn to feed ourselves because Jesus also wants us to learn how to feed others and then teach them how to feed themselves too. Jesus taught his disciples and showed them how to do it. And then he sent them out to have a go themselves. 
You know, if Jesus hadn't returned to heaven, I bet some of his disciples would have wanted to be sitting at his feet forever and not out there doing it themselves. Another unhelpful thing about having a professional clergy is that it gives the impression that telling people about Jesus and making disciples, helping people follow Jesus, can only be done by experts, by people with special knowledge, skills and training. Well, I spent three years at Bible College at Moorlands and three years training at Bristol Baptist College as well. And I learned lots of stuff, useful stuff, important stuff. But you know what I didn't learn? I didn't find any secret special knowledge. When we graduated, our tutor gave us each a verse. My verse was Galatians 5, 6. In Christ Jesus, the only thing that counts is faith working through love. I thought, oh, that's not very special. But then I thought again and asked, what is God telling me here? All you need is faith and love. Stop looking for the special knowledge, the special secret. Just get on with it. There is no special secret. There is no special niche. There are no special people. There is God and there is his word. And there is us. And we are all called to trust in him and his love for us and his love for the world. And we're called to put our faith in him and get on with it. That is what we celebrate at Pentecost. God's love and salvation and fullness of life are not just for a few, but for the many. Not just for one nation, Israel, but for every nation, every people group, every family, every adult, every child. God's new covenant is not just with Israel. God's new covenant is for everyone who will believe. Each of us is loved fully by God. Each of us receives the Holy Spirit. God loves you. God gives gifts to you and God wants to use you in his mission to fill the world with his love, peace, justice and joy. God wants to use each one of you to build up the church, to teach, encourage, challenge, support and equip one another. God wants to use each one of you to preach the good news of his love and his kingdom to the people who haven't heard. God wants to use each one of you to bring transformation to his world, to communities, nations and creation through your God-shaped lives and through your words of hope and love. So if the work is everybody's work, what am I here for? What am I here for as minister? Well, I see my role is to equip the saints for service. My role is to help redevelop the structures and attitudes, expectations and activities of Cowes Baptist Church so that they support you to grow. So you know that you are loved and held by God. So that you know what your gifts are and you can discern God's calling for you. So that as a church, we can support one another to grow, not just as believers, but as followers of Jesus and those that can help others to follow Jesus. And invite people to join us in Jesus' mission to transform cows and the world into a place of justice, joy and peace. That's why we celebrate Pentecost, because God has poured out his spirit on all. God loves you. God has given you gifts and God wants to use you. And he's joined us all by his spirit so that we can support and encourage and love one another. And that the world might see that love and know him through it. God bless you. Well, for 50 days, we have celebrated the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ over the powers of sin and death. We've proclaimed God's mighty acts and we've prayed that the power that was at work 
when God raised Jesus from the dead, might be at work in us. And as part of God's church here in Cowes, I'd like to call upon you to live out what you proclaim, as I've just been talking about. So if you wish to, join me in this declaration of intent. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, will you dare to walk into God's future, trusting him to be your guide? By the Spirit's power, we will. Will you dare to embrace each other and grow together in love? We will. Will you dare to share your riches in common and minister to each other in need? We will. Will you dare to pray for each other until your hearts beat with the longings of God? We will. Will you dare to carry the light of Christ into the world's dark places? We will. Let's continue to pray daily that God will empower us and enable us to do so.